Uh, hello, welcome to Tuesday morning's Habitat session. Um, I want to take a moment to thank our sponsors this, for this morning's session, uh, Wisconsin Lake and Pond Resources, LLC. My name is Jessica Hockey. I'll be the moderator for this session. I want to mention a couple of things before we get started. Our speakers will answer some questions if there's time at the end of each talk. At the top right hand side of your screen, you'll see a chat tab with Q&A. Um, if you put your uh, questions in that Q&A tab, then I'll be able to see that and ask the, our speakers that, those questions. Otherwise, I can't see questions in that chat tab. So uh, just keep that in mind. So getting right to it, uh, we have two speakers who will be presenting the same presentation, Chuck Druckery and Michelle Nault. And um, starting with Chuck, he has 25 years of experience as Marnette County um, Water Resources Specialist. In that time, he has worked with numerous county lake groups to address water quality concerns, respond to new aquatic invasive species, and develop lake and, and uh, watershed management plans to address water quality and manage invasive species. Chuck has been at the forefront of developing new and innovative methods for EWM, and I think that's Eurasian milfoil, if I'm not I'm mistaken. <laughs> not really my expertise, but. Um, and then Michelle is the statewide and a lake and reservoir ecologist with the Wisconsin DNR. Um, their talk is called Improving AIS Control Using Low-Cost Herbicide Enclosures. And just, to, just for clarification, AIS is something invasive species. Am I correct? Unmute, you, unmute yourself, Chuck. <laughs> Oh, you were just unmuted. Now you're muted again. Okay, now you're unmuted. All Hopefully. right. Yes. Okay. Aquatic invasive species. Great. That's what, <laughs> that's what I was wondering. All right, go ahead. Um, take it away. Okay. Thanks a lot. Um, again, my name is Chuck Druckery. I work for um, the Meredith County uh, Land and Water Conservation. And I'm going to try to get through this all uh, fairly quickly. Uh, hopefully, we'll have some time for questions at the end. Um, let me go here. So first of all, our project setting uh, for, this, for this project was Thunder Lake. It's about 10 miles uh, west of Krivitz in Wisconsin. Um, it's a deep, clear lake, average depth of about 20 feet, and uh, excellent water clarity, typically secudist range from 15 to 20 feet. Um, Eurasian water milfoil was discovered in the lake in 1992. At that time, the lake association had installed bottom barriers. Uh, those didn't work too well. Um, between 2001 and 2005, they did a little bit of uh, stocking of milfoil weevils. Again, uh, really no discernible effect on the milfoil. I started working with the lake group in 2008 when milfoil had really started to expand throughout the lake. For the first several years, it kind of behaved itself. Um, and then over the years, uh, starting in 2009, we kind of worked our way into an integrated Eurasian water milfoil management plan. Uh, between 2009 and 2012, we treated the lake with uh, aquatic herbicides several times using 2,4-D all of, all of the times. Um, we started out with about eight acres that we treated in 2009. By 2012, we were down to about two acres. Um, and we were having trouble with these small treatment areas. Some of these treatment areas were a quarter of an acre, half an acre or less. Um, and we weren't getting as good a control as when we had the larger, larger areas. And at the time, the milfoil had started to move into an area by the lake inlet where flowing water was uh, kind of hampering our herbicide efforts as well. Um, Starting in 2013, we uh, started dash harvesting on the lake. Uh, that's diver-assisted suction harvesting. It's very labor intensive, but we were able to uh, clean up the milfoil, the scattered plants on the west side of the lake, um, down by the boat landing, and then all of the little scattered stuff along the drop-offs around the lake. We, we did a pretty good job of keeping those under control uh, to the point where it was hard to find milfoil there. But this area by the inlet kept being a problem and also by the, on the other side of the point on the east side of the lake, 
So we really concentrated in 2017 and 18 on dash harvesting, especially by the inlet. Uh, spent a couple weeks of summer up there doing that. And that turned out to be a mistake <laughs> because while we were doing that, the milfoil was starting to pop up around the lake um, all over the place again. And in 2019, that's what this map shows, that the milfoil now had started to reestablish itself all over the lake where we had uh, controlled it. So it was uh, time for a reset. Uh, we needed to get back to uh, herbicide treatments in the large areas and save the dash harvesting for what it is best for, which is the scattered plants. Um, the first area we really needed to tackle was by the inlet. Um, on the east side of the inlet, this area was pretty much a monotype of Eurasian water milfoil. Um, and then on the west side, it was scattered in with a lot of pond weeds, but still a lot of dense areas of milfoil growth. Um, we have never had good luck here with herbicide treatments because of the flowing water coming in. So our idea, my idea was, well, let's divert the flow. I thought we'll, we'll build some kind of barrier, put it in here and divert the flow away from one side and then treat it and then move it to the other side. Uh, that pretty quickly evolved into if we're gonna put in a barrier and divert the flow, we might as well go all the way and contain the milfoil. So I actually called uh, Brenda Nordine and Michelle Nault and asked, okay, has this been done before? And it turns out the DNR had uh, considered this in 2014, uh, but it really was cost prohibitive. We started looking around and about the only thing that would fit the bill that's out there commercially available were these silt curtains that the DOT silt curtain, the light duty ones, the cheapest ones cost about $20 a foot. Um, and we were gonna need about a thousand feet of these things. And the, the they only had them in 10 foot tall lengths. We would have had to have them custom made. So it really was cost prohibitive. So we started thinking, you know, what do we really need? Uh, the DOT barriers are just too much. Uh, we wanted something that was lightweight, easy to deploy and didn't cost very much. So um, we basically needed a sheet of plastic that floated on the bottom and, and or floated on the top and then had a lead line on the bottom that would hold it to the bottom of the lake. So I bought, some uh, polyethylene sheeting. We scrounged up some uh, weighted net rope from the DNR, the lead line off of a, of a gill net. And for the float line, we had all, kind of, had all kinds of ideas at first or how we're gonna make this thing float, uh, swim noodles and, and net, net floats and things like that. And I finally settled on a foam backer rod, which is a closed cell foam extrusion that they use in, in concrete uh, industry for expansion joints and put some clips on it. And we built about 30 feet of this stuff. We took it out to Thunder Lake, we tossed it in. Um, little video here shows our first test. We sent a diver down and this was in November. So the diver we sent down was an intern because it was really cold. <laughs> and you can see the, the barrier sat on the bottom of the lake nicely. It floated at the surface. Um, we drove the boat around it making waves and it pretty much stayed in place. And we thought, okay, this is, this is it. Yeah, we gotta move on. There we go. So it was time for a grant. We started working with the DNR to put together a AIS control grant um, to construct the barriers. We needed to find a, a good method to construct them, develop methods to deploy and retrieve them. Uh, evaluate disinfection methods, and then to evaluate how effective they are. Are they gonna work? And for that, we were doing herbicide concentration monitoring and aquatic plant surveys. And the first two test plots, you can see, um, the first one had 330 feet of barrier enclosing about an acre. And then we moved over to the other side of the bay and we installed about 630 feet of this barrier enclosing about 1.6 acres. First question was, are we going to need a permit? Um, and we contacted the DNR waterways folks and they said, no, as long as we followed certain conditions, uh, no permit would be required. They have to be used for AIS control. Uh, the placement can be temporary up to 96 hours. There were certain signage and safety uh, requirements and you could not deny entry uh, to the public. Um, the, so we've developed some signage that we posted at the boat landing. Um, 
These are some of the signs that we used. You can see the buoys in the background. We're required to use buoys to mark the barriers. And on top of the buoys, we put other signs saying caution, herbicide treatment area in, pro you know, in progress. And we did not have any trouble with uh, people using them. Of course, we did this on weekdays and not on the weekend. And it was, uh, it was in late May. So um, that all went well. Um, the next thing we had to do was scale up production methods for these barriers. And I'm actually gonna skip ahead here. We're gonna put this at the end of the, the program. So we're gonna just move on to deploying the barriers. Um, we really, you know, with a new project, uh, I fully expected a lot of things to go wrong <laughs> and for this to be really difficult. And I was very pleasantly surprised to find out that it was pretty easy to do. Uh, once we had these things built, um, we put them on a on a spooling jig, uh, tie one end ashore and hit reverse and start spooling them out into the water. Um, we were also able to do mid lake installations. They were a little more difficult. Um, you have to use more anchors and uh, closing that loop isn't very elegant. But you can see in this picture, we did do a mid lake barrier uh, treatment. Um, I think in 2020. Here's a picture of the uh, pontoon boat we had outfitted for uh, deploying the barriers and retrieving them. It's our dash boat. And um, we just put that spooling jig on the front of the boat. These barriers are in spools that, that contain 100 feet of barrier. And um, we had two people on the front of the boat. They would be spooling it out and then attaching another small secondary anchor that we were using about every 20 feet, just clipping that onto the line. Um, in one of the first trials we did, there was a lot of movement of the barrier, just from kind of small wave action over a three-day period. So we decided to add some larger anchors. Uh, those are placed where the barriers are joined together and they have to be lowered with a rope because they put so much stress on the barrier. Um, just a word on the anchors, the small ones were kind of made out of uh, pop bottles or so, you know, water bottles. And we had, had kind of a medium sized one that was a milk jug with concrete in it. These were attached to the lead line using just a battery terminal clip. Um, the larger anchors that we had tried, first off, we used a three gallon bucket. Um, the three gallon size was just too large. These things weighed about 50 pounds and it was very difficult to pull them back off the bottom of the lake once they were stuck in. So we abandoned those and the next time we tried, we went to a two gallon pail and that was uh, a doable. It, it was a good compromise. It kept the barriers in place, but wasn't too heavy to lift. Um, the barriers are joined together each hundred foot length uh, with carabiners that we attach at the lead line at the, and at the float line. We put loops in the lead line and we clip them together. And then along the length of the, of the barrier, the width, we put these battery terminal clips again. And you can see here how they're joined together. The, there's a loop in the lead line. Uh, there's a rope that's put into the side of the barrier and they're, they're just held together with these battery, uh, battery test clips, they're called. They have a nice square jaw that you can see here. It really holds those ropes together good. Um, locating the barrier route, you know, anybody who is out on the lakes, you know, it's hard to find a precise, precise position when you're out on the lake. Um, and what we were doing is using a combination of a highly accurate GPS. We have a, a Trimble unit that has like a sub meter accuracy. Um, and then we would follow a contour. So we went out ahead of time um, the year before actually, and we would mark the route on our GPS that we wanted to place the barrier. Um, but then in Thunder Lake, uh, you know, when we're out there actually placing it, we know that milfoil has a real hard cutoff of 15 feet. We don't find it below growing deeper than 15 feet. So we'd be following the GPS and then watching the, the depth finder at the same time and just trying to stay on, a seven, on the 17 foot contour. You can also pre-mark your route with temporary buoys. And we did that in some places where we would just mark like a hard corner that we had to hit. Oh, I want to go back here and, and show you in this picture here, we have, you can see our boat right there as we're deploying barriers. We had one of the people on the lake had a drone and he was up there giving us pictures. It was really nice. There's 700 feet of barrier out here. There's seven of these 100 foot barriers. 
So I think we're just starting on the eighth one. So we, on the first test we did, we did an underwater inspection. We jumped in the water here. Uh, we had a pretty decent algae bloom going on the lake. Uh, it's about as stained as I've seen that water. Um, but we dove in, the barrier sat on the bottom, just like we expected it to, um, where the barriers were joined together with the battery uh, test clips. It did a pretty good job of holding them together. Those little gaps are pretty insignificant compared to how much uh, uh, water we're cutting off. And then the last picture here is just a, a pretty cool picture of some milfoil that has been trapped and has uh, no place to go. And then the herbicide application, uh, you're going to need to work with your applicator. Let them know that it is going to be uh, an enclosure treatment. Um, all of our larger ones were done with subsurface injection with a boat, so we had to leave a gap by the shoreline um, and then close that after the applicator left. The other alternative would be to sink a section of the float line. You could clip on some of those weights and it would just drag that float line down and it could drive over that uh, gap. For the small areas, they actually just did a pre-mix and dump. It was too small of an area to get the boat in. So he mixed up the herbicide and water um, in some of the jugs. And then we just took our little work boat and poke it over the top of the barrier and he would dump in the herbicide in a couple of different locations. That worked well. Uh, the barrier removal. Um, we didn't have any good pictures of the removal process. Everyone always seemed to be busy that day uh, working. Um, but it's easy to describe. Um, after some trial and error, uh, we found it was the easiest if we just went and lifted all the barriers where they were joined together and separated them. So you'd separate them, take off the carabiners and the clips, pull off the large anchors, and then toss it back into the lake. Um, then you go and then individually with each section of barrier, you work from downwind, you pick them up, we would duct tape them to the spool and wind them back up. It ends up being a, uh, a three person job, uh, minimum. You got two guys lifting the barrier on the front of the boat. Somebody is disconnecting the small anchors. Third person is winding the, the spool to uh, wind the barriers back up as the other two pull them up off out of the lake. Um, if you got a windy day, you're gonna need a fourth person on there to uh, control the boat at the same time. The, we actually broke an axle on our pontoon boat trailer in 2020, and we had one lake that we had to pull the barriers out yet. So we improvised, we took the, the spool holder, bolted it to some boards, and the lake luckily had a beach right next to where we put the barriers, and we screwed that down to the bulkhead on the beach. And we just went out with our little 14 foot boat you can see here and picked up the barriers one at a time, brought them over to the beach and we just wound them up and spooled them up right out of the boat. And this actually worked really well. Um, it's actually maybe even easier than using the pontoon boat. So the uh, barrier disinfection and storage, um, we were just drying them out. You're gonna need uh, a, large, a large black topper concrete area we used uh, the highway shop in Peshtigo and we'd spread them all out using that spool holder again. And we'd spread them out about six of them. By the time you got them all out, you'd start flipping them over. And by the time you got them all flipped over, you were ready to start picking them up again. So it went pretty quick. Um, like I said, we'd use the spool holder and we would store them indoors for the, till the next year. And during this time, I guess, when we're doing the drying, we would take uh, that opportunity to fix anything. Uh, usually we'd lose a few test clips or there might be some tears uh, where the anchor line or the lead line would tear away from the barrier. We'd fix those up. So does it kill aquatic invasive species? Um, I'm pretty confident it kills things like milfoil, you know, plant fragments. Um, but the other things, the more hardy aquatic invasive species, um, we didn't have money in the, in the grant to actually do like a quantitative analysis to see are we you know, is it gonna kill zebra mussel villagers or things like that? Um, we didn't have any of those in the lake. All we had was milfoil. So I guess I, at this point, I wouldn't trust that it would. I'd be leery about using these in multiple lakes on the same year. So my recommendation would be don't do that. Um, if you're going to be using these on your lake, uh, you may just wanna build enough for your lake. You're probably gonna be doing this uh, if not annually, then at least on a routine basis. And if you just have these for your lake, you don't have to worry about that. 
And now we're going to have a word from our sponsor. So Michelle Nault is going to be joining us. And um, she's going to be talking about the herbicide concentration data and the aquatic plant data from our trials. All right. Well, thanks so much for that introduction, Chuck. Um, like uh, Chuck mentioned, I'm Michelle Nault. I'm our statewide lakes and reservoir ecologist with the Wisconsin DNR. And uh, as Chuck mentioned, uh, he contacted both myself and the regional lake biologists pretty early on in this process with the ideas that he's presented and was successful at um, being awarded a surface water grant in our AIS control category in order to help support the uh, construction of the barrier as well as some of the monitoring information that I'm going to show. And so one of the goals of our department's aquatic plant management research program is to to collect information to better understand the efficacy and longevity of these chemical control activities that are being permitted for invasive aquatic plant control. And a lot of our work has focused primarily on Eurasian water milfoil, which is a non-native plant that's um, fairly ubiquitous now throughout Wisconsin um, and can be a management issue on, on certain water bodies. And so that the way that we've done this research is be worked with partners and um, other agency staff in order to collect both pre and post aquatic plant surveys associated with these treatments, as well as work with volunteers to help collect some of the herbicide concentration data, the water samples post treatment. And so um, we've done a lot of this research over the past decade and really we're trying to use this information to help improve our ability to control invasive species while minimizing damage to native plants, um, very beneficial parts of our lake ecosystem. And so if you're interested in learning more, um, my product pitch is to check out our DNR research website. We have a lot of fact sheets and other information about some of the research that we've done to date. Next slide. All right, and so some of that research over the past decade has focused on these smaller scale herbicide treatments. And what we have found through our research is that the initial concentrations that we're observing in the hours after treatment were often far below these intended target concentrations that we're aiming to, to achieve. And so this graph shows the herbicide concentration patterns for small scale 2,4-D treatments that were done in, in open water settings. So these are treatments that were three acres or less. And on the X axis on the bottom, we have the hours after treatment. And then on the Y axis, we have the concentration of 2,4-D that was observed in the water column. Uh, the two red lines are the target rates that we're aiming to achieve with these treatments. And what you'll notice is that these black boxes are far below where these red lines are. And these observed concentrations in these treatments were much lower than what some previous lab studies have indicated are necessary to uh, kill Eurasian water milfoil. And that's illustrated by this orange box. Um, and so the data from these treatments basically indicate that that rapid dissipation is occurring. And you can see that by these uh, next series of slides here, which was a rhodamine dye study that we did in collaboration with some partners that, that basically tracked the herbicide movement over time. And so you can see at one hour after treatment in these two sites, uh, the herbicide is, is there. The red areas are indicating that it's where we want it to be. Go ahead. And then by two hours after treatment, you can see that herbicide products start to move pretty quickly off site. Go ahead. By three hours after treatment, uh, those two treatment areas have actually combined into one and they're at relatively low levels. And then finally, by five hours after treatment, we can see that uh, the areas that we were targeting outlined in white there, um, most herbicide product isn't even there anymore. And the product that is there is at very low levels that are, are likely not able to control the milfoil that was present. And so this got us to the Thunder Lake uh, limno barrier treatments. Um, you know, in many of these small scale scenarios, we're already applying the herbicide product at the maximum label rate. And so we can't continue to, to increase how much herbicide we put out there 
But one thing that we can increase is the, the amount of exposure time that the herbicide is in contact with the plants. And so this idea of utilizing these, these physical limnobarrier curtains to keep that herbicide product where we wanted it to be uh, led to the pilot studies out on Thunder Lake. And so in 2019 and in 2020, um, uh, Chuck worked to deploy the limnobarrier curtains around some small areas of dense Eurasian water milfoil. And we tried a couple different rates and exposure times to better understand what the most ideal conditions might be. So we looked uh, at rates between two to four parts per million, which is what the label recommends for these smaller scale 2,4-D treatments. And then we looked at exposure times ranging from 24 hours up until 72 days. Immediately following the treatment, we removed these barriers and we monitored the herbicide concentrations both within the barrier curtains and outside of the barrier curtains during the treatment. And then we coupled that with that aquatic plant pre and post treatment data, um, both before treatment and after treatment. And so here's just an example of the grids that were used to collect the plant data. So on the left, you'll see the, the sub point intercept uh, sampling sites that we collected uh, both before and after treatment. And then on the right, you'll see the herbicide concentration monitoring stations, again, both within the barrier curtain and immediately outside the barrier curtain. All right, now what I'm going to do is just run you through some data from the four pilot studies sites that we've looked at. And so on this first slide here, um, what you're looking at is the hours after treatment on the bottom of the graph, and then the concentration of 2,4-D on the vertical y-axis. The red and blue solid lines indicate the herbicide levels that were observed within the barrier, and then the green and the purple lines are the herbicide concentrations observed outside the barrier. The red dashed line indicates where the herbicide concentration target was. And so at 24 hours after treatment, that, that limno barrier curtain was removed. Go ahead. And then what you'll see is that the herbicide concentrations that were within the barrier suddenly dropped. Um, they were able to basically escape from that barriered area and the herbicide concentrations outside the barrier suddenly spiked and increased. And so um, you'll also see that the mixing took place in about an hour or two, and then those herbicide concentrations quickly dropped to below detectable limits. And so this provides some very strong evidence that this limino barrier curtain was able to keep that herbicide product on site where we wanted it, and was, it did not uh, allow the product to dissipate off site where we didn't want it. Go ahead. And so this particular treatment, uh, we did again the pre and post monitoring of uh, aquatic plants. And we found that there was a 45% reduction in the frequency of Eurasian water milfoil. Um, in terms of other uh, significant changes, there was a uh, significant decline in one native plant, Illinois pondweed. Um, but other, other than that, overall, the native plants were relatively unimpacted by this uh, treatment. And so now here's the data from the West Exclosure. This was also done in 2019. Uh, the West Exclosure had a slightly lower target concentration, but the barrier was left out for 72 hours instead of 24. Again, you'll see that the target concentrations within the barrier um, uh, initially were uh, exhibited a little bit of mixing in the first hour or two but were um, relatively close to that target concentration with no herbicide seen outside of the barrier. And again, quickly following berry removal, we saw those concentrations drop back to below detectable limits. In terms of efficacy, um, the barrier that was in place a little bit longer, even at that lower rate, resulted in slightly better control of Eurasian water milfoil. So we saw a 75% relative reduction um, between the pre and post treatment. Um, and then our other significant changes observed, uh, we actually saw several native plants that significantly increased. Um, species like our slender naiad, uh, fry's pondweed, and largeleaf pondweed. And then we did see a decline in uh, Nutella, which is a macroalgae stonewort. 
And then our third case study was uh, conducted in 2020, and that was at the point. Um, again, this was a 48-hour uh, barrier uh, exposure time at a rate of 4.0. Um, very similar to we saw in the other two case studies, the concentrations within the barrier were very close to the target concentrations we were hoping to achieve, and very little herbicide was seen directly outside the barrier. And then again, very quick mixing and dissipation following that barrier removal. This particular uh, pilot study at the rate of 4.0 for 48 hours resulted in a 94% reduction in Eurasian water milfoil. So very good control uh, pre versus post treatment. And um, some uh, other impacts to natives were a slight decline in Cara as well as Sago pondweed um, and an increase in a uh, bladder wart species, small purple bladder wart. And then finally, our last case study, uh, this was a site done at the boat landing. Very similar trends again observed in the herbicide concentration data. Uh, good target concentrations, um, a little bit less than maybe what we were hoping for, but uh, sustained target concentrations within the treatment area. Very little observed outside the treatment area. And then finally, our efficacy information. Um, very similar uh, efficacy, we saw a 93% reduction in Eurasian water milfoil with a slight decline observed in uh, Illinois pondweed, a native species. Okay, and so just to tie things back up here, um, so the graph on the left is the herbicide concentration data that I showed earlier from these, these small scale treatments of three acres or less that were in open water without a limno barrier curtain. And then the graph now on the right is the same exact graph, but it illustrates the data that we've collected within these limno barrier curtains. And you can see that these boxes are right in the realm of where we want them to be for good Eurasian water milfoil control. Um, we're not only hitting our target concentrations that we're hoping to hit, but we're also maintaining those target concentrations over time and we're matching up very nicely with what some of the laboratory data shows us is needed in order to have good control. And so overall, these limno barriers are able to increase the likelihood of an effective treatment. Um, you know, uh, we're gonna collect some additional data in order to better understand the longevity of control. We are only in, you know, year two of our pilot study here. Um, but there are a couple other lake groups out there that are, are looking to build and utilize these limno barrier curtains in the future. And hopefully we can also, you know, quantitatively evaluate these efforts. And again, it's, it's another tool in our toolbox that um, in certain scenarios might be very beneficial for these smaller scale targeted treatments. So with that, I'll hand it back over to Chuck. Okay, thanks, Michelle. Um... Can you guys see me now? <laughs> My good, it should be. Um, okay, so the moving on here to the barrier construction. Uh, based on the number of calls I've been getting in emails, this is kind of what a lot of people have been asking about, so we're going to jump in it quickly. Uh, the materials that we use, uh, the base material is polyethylene sheeting, and there's two types out there. There's the string uh, reinforced poly sheeting, and, which is shown on the top, and then woven polyethylene sheeting on the bottom. I much prefer the woven polyethylene. Um, it's a little more slippery, it's lighter, it's definitely more workable. Um, I'd say for durability, they're both about the same, but I would definitely rather work with the woven polyethylene sheeting. Um, but the, the float line is closed cell foam backer rod. Uh, we get the one and a quarter inch diameter backer rod and it comes in 400 foot long spools. Um, the lead line is just that, it's lead core rope that is used in the commercial fishing industry for gill nets. Uh, we buy that in 600 foot long spools. And then you're gonna need a lot of battery test clips. Uh, these are used to attach the anchor, the small anchors onto the barriers and they're also used to attach the barriers to each other. We probably ordered 200 of these and the next year we ordered uh, some more. Other materials, um, the, the, the snap clamps to hold the float line on are made from one inch thin wall PVC pipe. You pick these up at Menards for like $2.10 a stick. 
Um, we had to make some spool ends that just we put on the on the spool core and that holds all the barrier in place. So it looks like a, a big uh, a big thread uh, thread spool. So anyway, you get eight of these out of sheet of plywood. They're two feet in diameter. A variety of anchors. Again, uh, we use the water bottle style, the gallon jug, and then maybe the two gallon jug about three quarters full. Don't don't bother with those big three gallon pails. Uh, they're just going to be too heavy. Um, and then we use uh, buoys that we have to that we have to use to mark the area. Um, these are just mooring buoys that you can purchase, um, and we would we made some signs that we would put on top, uh, warning people to stay out of the area. Um, the spool cores. Uh, this is just a piece of uh, five foot length of one and a half inch electrical conduit, and we would make the handles that are removable uh, from three quarter inch or three eighths inch threaded rod. As far as specialized tools, there's really not much. Uh, there's a standard hog ring pliers and hog rings. You can buy these at just about any hardware store. I guess the only specialized thing we used were these large hog ring pliers. Uh, there's an auto loading variety. And these use a large blunt aluminum ring. They use these in uh, cyclone fencing when they, when they build cyclone fences. Uh, spring clamps, this was uh, took a little trial and error figuring out how to make many hundreds of these little spring clamps to hold the float line on. I ended up uh, developing a little jig that I attached to a bandsaw. Um, we would take those uh, thin wall PVC pipe, the 10 foot lengths, cut them in thirds, and then run them through. And the jig would cut um, a section of the pipe off, leaving that gap. And it takes a lot of fiddling around to get that width right uh, so that they hold, but they're not too hard to uh, to put on the on the the float line. And then those had to be deburred and sanded. And then we would just chop them into three inch lengths on the on the chop saw. So when you're doing this work, uh, be safe, wear your uh, hearing protection and your glass and your uh, eye protection because occasionally we would have these things break when we're cutting them into sections. Um, our assembly line uh, was pretty straightforward. We have a spool holder that you can see on this end. Um, that's where we wind up the finished material. The little inset here just shows the gap in there that we use uh, to put the pipe in. There's an assembly table, just a bunch of saw horses and three sheets of plywood with some uh, two by fours uh, screwed on to make sides for the table. Then there's a material jig that sits at the far end. And you can see here, here's our material jig and we've got the polyethylene sheeting. On one end, we've got the foam core, and on the other end, we have the lead line. And here's our spool jig and our assembly table. So um, using this setup, uh, two people can make uh, 100 feet of this barrier in about 45 minutes. So it's a, it's a pretty quick process. The float line, um, I'll have a little video here of installing that. We twist the uh, backer rod onto the float line and you, you, you twist the foam backer rod backwards, install, uh, roll it into the material and install one of the test clips. And we put one of these every two feet along the barrier. And then for the lead line, it's pretty much the same process. We roll the lead line backward, we roll it backwards, roll it forward into the material, and then we add one of those uh, large hog rings and we were putting those about every 16 inches or so and that does a really good job of holding that lead line in place you can see this the side ropes the same thing it's just some ropes that are rolled into the side of the material and they're attached with these smaller hog rings and the um you can see here the loop in the bot in the lead line that we clamped in place and then the carabiner would hold it together when they're installed for costs um we had about $2 and 40 cents a foot. So that was a huge improvement over the $50 a foot that the uh, DOT herbicide barriers would cost. Um, and that was all our materials. If you included all the jigs and everything else and the tools, it brought it up to about $3 and 10 cents a foot. And I do have links um, that were all the suppliers that we'd use. Of course, there's other suppliers out there, but um, if you email me, I could send you a, I could send you that link.
And that's all I had. I guess if there's any time, we'd be happy to answer some questions. Okay, thank you, Chuck and Michelle. Uh, that great, great talk. Really interesting. Learned a lot. Um, and I and we do have a bunch of questions, and I, I think maybe we'll stick around a little bit longer anyway to answer a couple of these. Um, first, what what are the permitting requirements to install a barrier, especially ones that restrict access to riparian property, a public access site, and or for time periods of greater than 24 hours? Well, the, the DNR had said uh, that if you keep it under 96 hours there, and it is for AIS control, um, that there is no permit required. Um, you, do, you would need to notify any riparian landowners. Um, we never had any issues with them um, not, want, not wanting them installed because they want the, the milk oil control done. Um, but yeah, no permit is required to, to use these. Okay, great. Uh, moving on, was all the plastic sheet the same height, uh, the max depth of the treatment area? Uh, no, we actually built them in different widths. We had some five footers, some tens, and some twenties. In Thunder Lake, uh, like I said, we had milfoil to 15 feet, so we needed to use a lot of the 20 foot tall barriers. Okay, great. Um, we'll just keep on going here. In your opinion, would this be feasible on a much larger lake? Uh, Lake Kaganasa, I'm totally pronouncing that wrong, I'm sure. <laughs> on the Madison, <laughs> so, great, I'll never live that down. Uh, 30, 3,200 square acre, max de depth of about 35 to 40 feet. Again, well, is this feasible on a much larger lake? I, I think so. Um, the, I mean, we put out, we put out about 1,100 feet of it. It was the longest run we've done where we went shore to shore and we enclosed about three acres. Um, you know, it's, it's just going to be, can you anchor it? Um, it's easy to install. They, we, we, we could put in a thousand feet of this stuff in probably an hour, hour and a half at, at the most. And it takes a little longer to pull them out, but it wasn't, it wasn't too bad. Um, yeah, it's just a question of anchoring them and you're only going to leave in place usually for 24 hours. Um, well, 48 hours, actually, that, that would be the, the best results we had in the shorter time frame would be a 48 hour treatment. Sure. Okay. Um, uh, the next question is more of a comment and maybe you guys can comment on the comment. Um, this person is saying, I've found uh, Eurasian milfoil at 25 feet. Is that, is that something you see very often? I don't know about Michelle, we've seen it. We've seen it to about 18 or 19 on some real clear lakes, but uh, that's, that's the farthest I've seen it growing, the deepest I've seen it growing. Yeah, it's based on water clarity. So, you know, 25 feet is not completely unheard of, but it's, it's probably on the more extreme side. So must, that lake must have pretty good water clarity. Okay. And maybe one more question here. Uh, how many people were involved in this project? Hmm. <laughs> well, we had, from the county's end, we basically had myself and, uh, and our intern were the only paid staff working on this. Uh, the Lake Association provided, um, you know, quite a bit of volunteer labor for doing these things. And then, uh, you know, the, on the DNR's end, um, we had Michelle Nault and, and Brenda Nordeen um, worked with them a lot, especially on the, on the, on the herbicide monitoring. And we also had volunteers taking the uh, herbicide uh, samples for us. So as long as you had a, a few volunteers to help out, you, you could get by with just a couple of you, it sounds yeah, like. Yeah, especially for that monitoring. We had people out there at, you know, 10 o'clock at night taking uh, nice. water samples because they were on a schedule. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Great. Go ahead, Michelle. Oh, I'll just add, I, I, I think it's important, you know, if you are going to implement something like this, definitely reach out to your local DNR lake biologist. Um, they can help you with some of the permitting questions. You do still need a permit for the herbicide application. Um, if you can't meet some of those barrier requirements in the exemption, they can also help you work with the water reg and zoning folks. So, um, so bring them in and we'll, we'll help you along for sure. Great. Okay. Well, I think um, we're going to close out this session. Again, if you have questions that you didn't get answered, go ahead and email Chuck. His email address is right there. I'm sure he'll be happy to answer any of your questions. 
Um, we're going to take a short break now. Um, maybe you could do some networking and we'll convene back here at about 11 o'clock. Again, thank you to our speakers and thank you to the audience. Appreci appreciate you having, having you here. Thank you.